VTSAX and chill. What is it and why it's likely the best strategy for you to achieve financial independence? We discuss this and much more with the godfather of Phi. Here we go. Welcome to the Forget About Money podcast, where we encourage you to take action today so that you can focus on what matters most to you. Today, we've got none other than the godfather of Phi himself. He is the author of three extremely successful finance books, one of which can be considered the foundational text of the financial independence community. I'm honored to have you here, JL. Welcome. Hey, David. It's an honor to be here. I appreciate the invitation. And it's fun to finally uh, uh, actually chat with you and, and see you. I've, we've had so much communication and over the years, but uh, this is the first time, as you mentioned, that we've actually spoken. First off, I want to thank you for what you have brought to me. Uh, I was one of those guys that I was probably inclined more than the next, like learn about money stuff early on. I remember reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad when I was 18 or 19. I remember uh, reading uh, Rick Edelman books and the Susie Orman books, all of that when I was fairly young, late teens, early 20s. And yet I still felt that there was something kind of incongruent, like that didn't really connect the dots for me. Mm. Uh, yes, I understood investing. I understand the terminology, but how did it actually apply to my life? How could that actually intersect to how I'm living my life and what my financial goals are? And in around, I think 2015, Steve and my brother turned me on to Mr. Money Mustache and the financial independence community. And that's the first time that I actually had a goal post because it, up to that point, you just heard invest 10 to 15% of your money until you're 65, and then you can go play golf every day. Well, that didn't really mean a whole lot to me. Uh, so I really appreciated the financial independence community because they said, no, there's a number, and this is how you figure it out, 4% rule, all of that. And you finally had a very specific goal post. And right after that, uh, I think you published Simple Path to Wealth in 2016. Is that correct? Yes. And right after that, that book hit the shelves and basically took the world by storm, or at least the financial world by storm, always ranking up in the you know top three or top five of finance books. Every time I go to the Amazon page, it lists the top selling finance books. And it's also the single book that I have gifted the most to people who I think need to get into a more solid financial footing for themselves and their families. So I appreciate it. Uh, and thank you so much for sharing that information. And that information may have been out there, but the way you message it, and it may not have been out there, to be honest with you, because I, I've never heard it before, the book, but the way you message it, the way your voice, for one thing, in that audiobook is pretty amazing. And most people right now that are hearing this, are going to hear your voice and they're going to be also impressed. Uh, that was just icing on the cake. But uh, thank you very much for the, for the impact that you've made, not just on me, but people that I know personally, and then all of those people out there, thousands of people that I don't know personally, but I know that you've helped. So thank you for that. Well, I, what, a, what a kind introduction. Uh, th thank you, David. You know, it's uh, the simple path to wealth has is, is exceeded far beyond my expectations. And it took me three years uh, from beginning to, to publication to get it done. And mostly because I, I would throw it down in disgust because writing a book is so much work and you have no idea if anybody's going to care, right? And, uh, you know, I, I, I put it away for months at a time. I mean, the actual work of the book probably only took a year, but it took me three years because I'd, you know, I'd step away from it for months at a time before I drag myself to the table. So I... I was hoping it would be modestly successful and worth the effort. I remember early on when it was first published and it was selling a few copies, I, I did a rough calculation. I, I sort of figured about how many hours over that three years that I put into it and how much money it had made at that point. And I figured, you know, I'd been better served working at McDonald's. But at this point, no, I've been better served having write, written the book. It's It's... Yeah, again, beyond my wildest expectations. And the core of the book is that building wealth does not have to be complicated. And in most cases, you're going to be better off just going the simple route. Can you describe what that simple route is? Yeah, so first of all, not only does it not have to be complicated, but 
the more complicated it is, by definition, almost the less effective it will be. So that's counterintuitive, I think, for most people who are first hearing about this, because if you turn on CNBC or any of the financial news channels, or for that matter, if you read a lot of the stuff written about investing, it seems incredibly complex. And that's because what those guys are talking about is, in fact, incredibly complex. I mean, notoriously complex. There was, you know, during the debacle in, in 08, 09, you know, it came out that Wall Street had created these derivatives that even they didn't understand. So anybody listening to this who says, wait a minute, you know, everything that I've ever heard makes investing sound complex. Well, you're right. You know, everything you ever heard probably does. That's the bad news. The good news is none of that stuff matters. You know, if you think about it as a huge banquet table filled with every kind of exotic thing you can imagine, well, you know, those things are complex and difficult to make. But in the tiny little corner of that table, maybe there's the real basic foods that your body really needs and thrives on, actually, that will make you healthier. So you can put your arm on that table and sweep all that other stuff onto the floor and focus on those really basic things that actually will make you healthier. It's the same thing with investing. All of that complex stuff you hear about, you don't have to pay any attention to. The only thing that really matters if you want to build wealth are low-cost, broad-based index funds. The one I prefer is VTSAX. And what is a low-cost, broad-market index fund? So Jack Bogle, who is the guy who who, uh, started Vanguard back in 1975, is the guy who first sort of came up with this idea that instead of trying to pick individual stocks that might outperform all the other individual stocks you could choose, you would be better off simply buying all of the stocks in an index. So an index can be almost anything. But when I say broad based, I'm talking about something that follows, say, the S&P 500, which are the 500 largest companies uh, in the United States, or my preference is what's called a total stock market fund. That's what VTSAX is. And if you invest in VTSAX, you're investing in virtually every publicly traded company in the United States. And that means that everybody in those companies is working to make you richer. It's a very strong position to be in. You know, the number of stocks that represents varies because stocks come on the index and they fall off the index but it's roughly about 4,000 stocks. So very broad uh, diversification. So that's a basic index fund. So the argument that, like say somebody just sees one ticker symbol and that's VTSAX. When we're used to seeing ticker symbols for individual companies, it's not the same. It's a lot of companies, not just, you know, one specific sector or one specific company. So the argument, at least you might think just one ticker symbol, you're only investing in one thing but you're actually extremely diverse. Your your portfolio is very diverse because it's across 4,000 plus stocks, correct? Correct. So both things are true, right? You are, if you invest in VTA, VTSAX, and that, by the way, is not the only total stock market fund out there. It's the one that Vanguard uh, puts out, and, and I'm a fan of Vanguard. So that's the reason I choose it. If you invest in VTSAX, you are buying one fund or one uh, ETF, which would be VTI is the same portfolio. But as you point out, you are you are then the owner of about 4,000 different companies within that one fund. That's dramatically different than just buying a single stock. And you also alluded to the fact that, that you know, indexing has become so popular and now there are indexes for sectors. So you can buy an index for precious metals, an index fund for precious metals or for technology or for financial uh, companies. I am not recommending those either because I want that broad base. And the reason I want the broad base is it's self-cleansing. Everything else you buy, if you buy an individual stock, even if you if you buy a stock that you think is going to be great and in fact turns out to perform well for you, you always have to, in the back of your mind, be asking, how long is that going to last? Because companies have life cycles. Sometimes, you know, like Sears, they can last for over 100 years before they implode. 
as Sears did, because Walmart and then Amazon came came along and ate its lunch. Sometimes they don't last nearly as long. In fact, most often they don't last nearly as long as that. So you always have to be wondering how long is this? If 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 you were skilled enough, lucky enough to choose a winner, how long am I going to be willing to hold it? If you own VTSAX as an example, you never have to worry about that. I'm never going to sell my shares other than maybe a few to live on in in my retirement because it has the quality of being self-cleansing. And what that means is that the companies that perform well rise to the top and it's cap weighted. So the more successful a company is, the more of it I'm going to own in the fund. That's a good thing. Some people point it out as a flaw or a bug. For me, it's a feature. I want to own more of the most successful companies. By the same token, those companies that are fading, that are are not succeeding for whatever reason, maybe they're mismanaged, maybe their life cycle is just coming to an end, they drift off the index. And I don't have to guess as to which companies are going to be the ones rising to the top and which ones are going to fade. That happens automatically for me in that self-cleansing process. So I never have to think about ever selling it or timing it. And trying to time things is is poison to your results over time. Those are very accurate words. I remember when I was in my mid-20s, mid to late 20s, I'm a smart guy. I've, like I said, I read all these books. I know what I'm doing, right? So I get in there and I remember I bought some leveraged gold miner ETFs. Oh my. Just, <laughs> anytime you say like any one of those separately is probably not great either, <laughs> just gold or anything leveraged, but I did. And I did, I was doing it inside my Roth. <clears throat> and then my, my brother did my taxes the next year. He said, that's pretty impressive. I'm like, what? I lost $30,000. He's like, yeah, he had, seems like you probably had to work pretty hard to lose that much money. So <laughs> didn't work out well for me. And you managed to lose it in a vehicle where you couldn't take the tax deduction for the capital loss. <laughs> right. Right. So, but, uh, and I'd like to say I learned the error of my ways, but there was a few more missteps even after, uh, you know, as far as like my attempts at market timing, thinking I'm a smarter than the market. It has never worked out. Not once. Don't don't feel bad. I've, I've made all of the same kinds of mistakes and I have probably made them for more years and more repeatedly than you have. So, yeah, I, I feel your pain. And, and sometimes I wonder, do you have to go through that that pain, that process yourself to learn this? Or more hopefully, I'm, you know, I kind of hope that somebody will pick up the simple path to wealth and maybe my other books and not have to make those same mistakes that you and I made and they can just start prospering right away. Right. But I don't know that that's possible because the allure of, of choosing stocks and thinking you can outperform and, and uh, what have you is just so strong. And of course, it's so aggressively promoted. Uh, because the people selling these things make a ton of money by virtue of convincing you that you ought to buy them. Uh, and even more recently, you've got the Robinhood apps and you've got, oh yeah, the you know, it's just, and then you've got all the subgroups. So people, you know, working together to try to time the market and yeah. buy this or that and crypto and, you know, catching the waves of the trend lines and all of those things that can be exciting, but it's probably not going to make you successful. Uh, if you look at the stats, well, uh, in the most cases, you're going to end up losing money. Yeah, it can certainly be exciting. But one of my key tenets is I don't expect my money to entertain me or provide excitement in my life. All I expect my money to do is work for me, is to make more money. And I think the more different things you ask your money to do for you, the less well it will do any one of those things. So I always kind of cringe a little bit when people say, oh, you know, I'm investing in this because it's exciting. And or I'm going to set a certain part of my money, you know, for entertainment, for investing entertainment. I'm like, I find other ways to entertain yourself. I mean, don't expect your money to entertain you. You know, at least that's my philosophy. I just want my money working for me. So if if you if timing the market or stock picking generally results in losses, what kind of market returns can we expect with the VTSAX and chill strategy? Well, so first of all, I. It, it, Timing, you know, timing the market and picking individual stocks doesn't necessarily result in losses. So one of my dirty little secrets is I actually achieved financial independence back when I was about 40 years old, which is more years ago than I 
comfortably want to look at by being a stock picker or a, by extension picking actively managed funds that were run by stock pickers. So that's difficult. And, you know, you a lot of people do, in fact, lose significant money in trying to do it, but it can be done. And I did it with moderate success. So it's not that it can't work. And that indexing, you know, it's not like that's a bad thing that never works and indexing is a good thing that that works. It's, in my experience at least, picking individual stocks was effective. It did work. It got me to be financial ind- financially independent. And that's one of the reasons it took me a long time personally to embrace indexing is because what, what I was doing was working. But what I finally realized is that it was a whole lot more effort on my part to get those results And those results were not as strong as the simple indexing that took no effort at all. And once that got through my thick skull that I could get better results for not only less effort, but virtually no effort, well, then indexing became a no-brainer, but I'm a a slow learner. So that's the first thing to appreciate, that that when you're having these conversations, you're going to talk to people, say, I'm doing fine picking individual stocks. And in fact... They might be, uh, but with a whole lot more effort and probably over time, less good results. So when I was writing the Simple Path to Wealth, uh, which again, as you as you mentioned, I published in 2016. So I was kind of you know doing the final revisions of it in 2015, and I thought you know uh, there part of it, part of the stuff I talk about in there is historic returns. Uh, and so I was looking at the returns of the S and P 500 index because VTSAX doesn't go back to 1975, which is I wanted that 40 year period. Because 1975 is the f- year that Jack Bogle brought out the first index fund, which was an S and P 500 fund. Also happened to be the year that I started investing myself. So that 40 year period from 1975 to 2015, I thought was a nice long period. And I I had the historical numbers for the S&P 500 fund. I thought, I I know what those are and talk about it in the book. Well, when I ran the numbers, the return was just over 12% a year. And that's a stunningly large number and a number that I was not comfortable putting in the book because I didn't want people to think you could expect to get 12% a year, right? Because that's, you know, I, I don't I don't think you should count on getting 12% a year. And yet, for 40 years, that was the actual return. And to be clear, this was not some idyllic 40-year period. In fact, I wrote a post on the blog after the book came out called... Um, time machine and the expected return of stocks or something along those lines. It's one of my favorite posts. And the conceit in there is you're sitting around with a bunch of your friends in 1975 saying, hey, you know, this guy Jack Bogle just brought out this index fund. I wonder how things are going to work out for it. And I raise my hand and I say, well, I can actually answer that question because I just got back from 2015 in my time machine and I can tell you exactly what's happened in that 40-year period. And what happened is you had in the 70s high inflation, you know, stagflation. You had Business Week coming out with a cover that said the death of equities. You know, you had a nice bull run in the 80s. And then you had Black Monday in 87, biggest single day percentage drop in the market in history, bigger even than anything in the Great Depression. And then you had the tech collapse in 08 in uh, the end of the 90s, in 99, 2000. And then, of course, you had the debacle in in 07, 08, 09, uh, not to mention, you know, the the attack on the Twin Towers, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq that dragged on and draining money and treasure. And and you had all these terrible things that happened in that 40-year period. And, And in my blog post, everybody's sitting around the campfire saying, well, you know, Clearly, I'm not going to be investing in stocks for the next 40 years. This is that's awful. And of course, the punchline is that yeah, and in spite of all those things, stocks went up just shy of 12 percent a year. Now, also to be clear, there's probably not a single year where stocks actually went up 12 percent. You know, there are years where it goes up much more dramatically than that, and then of course there are years where it goes down dramatically. 
as we mentioned with the you know the collapse in 87 and and around 2000 and again in 08 09 so it's a volatile ride but averaged out it was kind of a stunning number so if somebody's listening to this and they're wondering what kind of return they can expect uh, if they do decide to invest in a broad market low cost index fund is it fair to say that they will they can expect for their planning purposes between 8 and 11% on average, what are your thoughts on that? What, what would be a good planning assumption? I think when you, go, you think? when you go back like 100 years, the the market does something like 10, 11% over time. But again, remembering that there are extended periods of time where it's down. And so it's a very, it's a very volatile ride. I, I, I don't think about it in terms of, of what my expected total return is going to be. I I kind of like what's come to be known as the 4% rule, which I think of more as a guideline. And that suggests that if you're living on your portfolio, <clears throat> you can comfortably withdraw 4% a year to live on, adjust it for inflation, and the portfolio will have enough left behind to continue to grow, outpace inflation, and, and last for an extended period of time. The Trinity study looks at 30-year periods of time and and that works at 96% of the time that at the end of 30 years, you still have some money. Most of the time, interestingly enough, your money's grown to extraordinary proportions. So it's not something you want to set on autopilot. You want to pay attention because if the stock market winds happen to go against you, especially early on in living on a portfolio, you're going to have to adjust your spending accordingly because you don't want to, you don't want to be in that 4% of the time that runs out of money. But also, as I say, much more frequently, your portfolio is going to grow dramatically and you don't want to miss out on having the opportunity to enjoy that money as the years roll on. So 4% is a good guideline. It, it, it sort of uh, implies that you're going to get about an 8 plus percent return over time. And I think that's a reasonable way to think about it. What are your thoughts about as you get older or closer to retirement age and reducing the amount that you have in stocks and increasing the amount that you have in bonds. Is that something you personally adhere to or advocate uh, for others? So I, I don't think of it, the answer, the basic answer is yes, but I don't think of it so much in terms of age, right? So the traditional way of thinking about this stuff is that you're going to, you're going to come out of school you're going to get a job. You're going to work for 40 odd years. You're going to retire at 65. And, and so traditionally people say, as you get older, you want to add more bonds, which are a conservative uh, balance to the stock portfolio. Uh, the thing you have to understand is that bonds smooth the ride, uh, but they don't have the engine of growth that you want for your portfolio to last and, and, uh, and to continue. So you, you are always going to want to own a pretty good slug of, of stocks. My way of thinking, because in this financial independence community that I rate for, there are a lot of people who retire much earlier than the traditional age. So I look at it and I say, when you're working and you're earning income, as my daughter is, for instance, I'm going to want to be 100% in VTSAX, which is to say 100% of stocks. That's considered very aggressive because if you're striving for financial independence, you are going to be taking a fairly large percentage of your income and putting it in your investments. And that means that whenever the market drops, which is a perfectly normal part of the process, should never be upsetting to you, should never be surprising. When the market drops, you're taking advantage of that because that amount of money that you're putting in, say, every month, you're buying those shares now on sale. That's a good thing. And that's the tool that smooths the ride for you, the volatility of stocks, turns that volatility into an advantage for you. Now, if you stop working, you're probably going to want something to take the place of that cash flow out of your earned income, right? Because you don't have earned income anymore. And that's, that's the role that bonds can play. So you add bonds to the portfolio, that stabilizes the volatility of stocks a little bit, also provides some dry powder to take advantage of when the market drops and you can shift some of that bond money into stocks at those bargain prices. But that might happen in this community when you're 30, 
you might step away from your job and add bonds. And then maybe when you're 35, you say, you know what, I've started this little business and it's doing well, it's prospering. Or I started this new career or I went back to my old career, whatever. When you have income flowing again, then you probably want to shift out of the the bonds and back into 100% stocks. So I think of it as the wealth accumulation stage when you're working and you have cash flow and the wealth preservation stage when you're living on the portfolio. And that informs whether or not to add bonds. Yeah, I like that idea. I, I had not thought of you know, traditionally, you think about bonds as like mitigating the downside risk mm-hmm. and evening it out the ride. But practically, and I never even thought about, you know, what if you get a side hustle that gets more income or you go back to work right. or something else that actually does mitigate that downside risk. So then you've taken that risk out mostly, or at least the response to that downside risk is is accounted for. So, yeah, thanks for sharing that. That's something new in my thinking that I'd never considered before when about thinking about the stock bond allocation as you age. So, or as life circum- circumstances, you know, change. Right, right. So, yeah. Um, when you were preparing and writing for The Simple Path to Wealth, did, did this, was this an epiphany moment for you at some point that said, wait, why am I doing it this way because of this? Was it something you academically studied and then the, the light switch came on? Or is it something that you became uh, familiar with through your own experiences and your own investing? So if you're talking about the, the philosophy, the investment approach in the simple path to wealth. Yes. Yeah, that was, that was something that evolved over time. Uh, you know, I mentioned that that I started investing in 1975, which coincidentally was the same year that Jack Bogle introduced the first index fund, the S&P 500 index fund. I didn't know that at the time. I, I, I wish I had known it at the time. And more importantly, I wish I had been wise enough at the time to embrace it because the path would have been a lot easier for me and, and a lot more lucrative. But I didn't know it. And I would not have embraced it at the time, even if I had. And the reason I know that is 10 years later uh, is when I did learn about the, the existence of these things called index funds. And, and I just refused to accept, accept it even then. And as I alluded to earlier, part of it was I was doing okay picking individual stocks and picking actively managed funds. And it's kind of a hard psychological thing to wrap your head around if you're into this stuff because you know when somebody says as index investing does that you'll get a better result just buying everything well at least i was saying to myself well no that doesn't make sense all i have to do is just avoid the bad companies and i'll outperform the index you know or just focus on the good companies and i'll outperform the index well of course the problem is is sometimes those bad companies are tomorrow's exciting turnaround stories and sometimes today's good companies are the ones that are just on their way down. So it turns out that it's extraordinarily difficult to actually choose winners and losers, especially over time. That was Jack Bogle's brilliant insight. And of course, when he first launched these things, people mocked him, especially people in the business for two reasons. One, it went counter to everything they thought they knew. But the other thing is they recognized this was a real threat to their income because they made money selling these active things to to investors like us. You know, um, the guy who ran Fidelity Investments at the time uh, ran a series of ads, this is in the 1970s, calling indexing un-American, right? And Jack Bogle, to his great credit, had the ads framed and mounted in his office. But now, as we're, you know, 40-plus years on, there's been enormous amounts of research done on the effectiveness of indexing, and the message is clear. Indexing is, in fact, the superior way to invest, and outperforming the index, especially over time, is is vanishingly difficult. And so some of the things that make VTSAX and other funds like it a good thing to invest in, uh, we've already talked about diversification, uh, we talked about the market returns, but additionally to that, these, especially when compared to actively managed funds, is lower fees, uh, lower taxes, because there's fewer taxable events inside the fund itself because they're not being traded as often, uh, because basically a buy and hold until a stock falls out of that particular 
uh, index fund and compounding, which is can be for any sound investment. And then the philosophy that you really embrace is simplicity. And I think as I've gotten older, simplicity has taken more of a forefront in my own life, not just in investing, but in life in general. And if you can simplify what is traditionally deemed something either scary or complex like money, then I think that's a huge win. And it's a big part of our lives, whether you can say money buys happiness or doesn't buy happiness and all of those things. But it definitely, if you don't have money, you're going to have some challenges that you probably would rather not face. So if you can take that money piece of the pie, make it simple, and which you have, uh, and then people take those actions. Let, let it takes, for example, if I'm listening to this and I've got a, I work for a company and they've got 401k. And I don't really even know what I'm invested in. I just signed up whenever I went to HR upon being hired, did my 3% or whatever it is. Maybe I don't even know what my company matches up to. So I've got some homework to do. But part of that homework should be take a look at what funds are offered. And now if after hearing this, I'm like, okay, I'm looking for VTSAX. Where is it? If it's not there, as far as one of my investing options, in your opinion, what do I do then? Well, so you covered a lot of ground there. Uh, yeah. So, so backing up a little bit, uh, you know, to your point about fees and you know the other characteristics of of something like VTSAX, uh, fees are critical. Uh, Jack Bogle has a great line uh, uh, where he says, "You know, performance comes and goes, but fees are forever." And fees are an enormous drag on your investment return over time. They are critical. They can sound small if if somebody says, oh, I'm only charging you 1% or 2% a year. People tend to think, oh, that's not much. But combo, compounded over time, that's huge. And those were the kinds of fees that were typical in actively managed funds. Because of the competitive pressure from indexing, those fees have come down. But they can still be you know, 1% or 0.75%. Something like VTSAX is 0.03%. I mean, it's almost non-existent. And that makes an incredible difference uh, in your performance. And then you mentioned, you know, tax efficiency. Uh, you know, if you're holding these things in a 401k or an IRA, it doesn't matter so much. But in an active, in a, in a taxable account where you're trading, well, every time you trade a stock, it's a taxable event. And that makes your tax return a lot more complicated. But also that's that continual drag as taxes come out of, out of your returns. And as you alluded to, an actively managed fund, of course, is doing that trading within the fund. And typically, at the end of the year in those funds, you will get what's called a capital gains distribution, which is a taxable event. So indexing is much more tax efficient. So those are all important advantages of of indexing. But going back to your last point, if you're looking at your 401k, you know, how do you find the right fund? And what I tell people to do and this ties into the fee question, is you should have a list of all the different funds that are available in your 401k. And there should be a column that lists the expense ratio, the ER, which is the annual fee the fund charges, right? And so when I say an actively managed fund might have an expense ratio of 1%, that's where you'll find it. So if you take your finger on that column and you run it down, you start looking for the smallest number on there. You know, you start looking for something that's instead of being, you know, 1.05% is 0.05% or 0.03%. You you look for those really low numbers and that will be a good indicator that those are the index funds. And then you can zero in in on them and you want to find a broad-based one. So something that follows the index Five, the uh, S&P 500 index is a good one or something that follows the total stock market index. Most commonly, and I think this is changing, but most commonly you'd find an S&P 500 index fund in a 401k and those are fine. They, they're, they're great. I mean, there's, you don't have to obsess about not having a total stock market fund if you have access to that. Yeah, traditionally, I believe the S&P and the VTSEX they, they pretty much move in lockstep. Is that correct? They track very, very closely. Yeah. And Jack Vogel himself held the S&P 500 fund his entire life. He's passed away now. So I have a slight preference for the total stock market because it includes some small cap and, and mid cap stocks. But because these things are cap weighted, 
which means the bigger the company, the larger percentage uh, of the fund it represents. You know, the uh, VTSAX is about 80, maybe even 85 percent the S&P 500. So there's, yeah, they're very, very close and they track very closely. And I think just another vote of confidence for indexing is, you know, Warren Buffett, I believe I might get this wrong, but I think Warren Buffett said when he dies, his net worth should just go straight to an S&P 500 for his family. What he does leave to his family. I know he's going to give a lot of it away. Yeah, but he does. If, if even Warren Buffett, the best investor in history, can say S and P five hundred index fund is the way to go, then I think it's probably good for the rest of us. You know, they, that's that is a striking. You're correct about that, and specifically, he says you know put ninety percent in an S and P five hundred uh, index fund, and he recommends Vanguard's, and the other ten percent in in cash, cash equivalents. And what's really interesting to me is he doesn't recommend Berkshire Hathaway. And, hmm. you know, Berkshire Hathaway has been an extraordinary uh, performer. I, I, I haven't looked at the numbers recently. As it's gotten so large, it's become more and more difficult for it to outperform the market. But for a long time, it outperformed the market, one of the very few that, that do. But that's not what he's recommending. And speculating here, I think there's two reasons for that. One is that it's gotten so large outperformance by his own admission, if you read his uh, letters to investors, uh, his annual letter, you know, it becomes harder and harder to outperform when you have that much money to deploy. So that's probably one reason. But the other reason, and he talks a lot about the very competent management team that's in behind him, you know, he and Charlie Munger built that company. Charlie has already passed away. Warren's in his 90s. And I think there's an admission that, you know, Charlie and Warren had the magic fairy dust that it takes to outperform the market. And there's no guarantee as competent as the team that they put together have that same magic. And it is almost magic because it's so difficult to outperform and particularly difficult, again, if you're trying to deploy huge amounts of money as Berkshire at this point is. So it's it's striking to me that that's his recommendation. And it's a great one. And it's one that served you and me and uh, many Many, many, uh, as far as the index fund investing, uh, very well. So the source of inspiration for your Simple Path to Wealth book was for you writing to your daughter to teach her how to manage money. At the time that you wrote this book, she she's in her 30s now, is that right? Yeah, she, she was in college at the time. Okay, so she was a young adult at the time. Yeah. And but before she was a young adult, I mean, you, you didn't just, like, say, like you said, you didn't just flip a switch and, and this book was birthed, you know, so you had time and she, and of course you were, you raised her. So during, uh, during that time between birth and 20, you, this is something that you were at least somewhat passionate about over that time. And as a parent, you're like, this, this isn't some important stuff here. And I want to impart some of this wisdom on my child so that they maybe have a, a leg up in the world as they venture into adulthood. How did that process go and how did that result in you actually writing this book? Yeah, so my my friend Christy Shen, who, who wrote the book, uh, Quit Like a Millionaire, and uh, she and her husband Bryce have a blog called uh, Millennial Revolution. She has a great line, which I'm probably gonna butcher, but it's something to the effect of, if you understand money, uh, life is really easy. If you don't understand money, life is dramatically hard, right? And I think there's a lot of truth in that. And of course, like every parent, I want my kid to have the best possible life. But that led me to make a critical mistake of pushing this stuff way too hard, way too young, right? And I managed to turn her off to all things financial. And that was terrifying to me because, again, if you don't understand money, life is in our modern world is very hard. Uh, my wife used to tell me, you know, she's absorbing more than she lets you know. And it, I've come to realize that that's true, but I didn't know that at the time. And so um, in 2011, I started to think, you know, I better, because she's not listening to me, I better start getting some of this stuff down on paper so that when I'm dead and gone, if she's ever willing to hear it, it's available to her. So I started, I started doing that. I started writing essentially letters to her about this stuff. And a friend of mine 
I, sh- I shared it with a friend and he said, this is pretty interesting. You ought to put this on a blog. Well, at that point I'd heard of blogs. I kind of vaguely knew what they were. I'd never actually looked at one. I joked that the first blog post I ever read was the first one I wrote, but what appealed to me was not building a blog audience, but this seemed like a great way to archive the information to make it easily available. So I created my blog, jlcollinsnh.com, and to archive this information, and I started writing a series of posts about it. And that was kind of the beginning. And then I discovered that there were other people writing about this stuff, and uh, like Mr. Money Mustache and... Uh, uh, there's the one that was before him, um, your early retirement extreme, uh, you know, which led me to Mr. Money Mustache. And I, so suddenly there was this whole community of people out there talking about things uh, along these lines that was of interest. So, so I started the blog in 2011 and then my reader, I started to develop this readership, which amazed me. I, I was never a goal and I never expected it, but suddenly I had this readership that was commenting on my work and asking questions. And so then that gave me, I said, I'd say, oh yeah, I, I, you know, I should write about that too. So that, that would be uh, another post. So I now have the core of the blog is what's called the stock series, which is about 35 posts. And that's about half of the content of the blog, maybe a little less. Well, when I first came up with that idea of doing a stock series, it's only the first five in there that I had in mind. I mean, the rest of them kind of grew organically. Uh, and then around 2013, uh, I, I began to realize that I, I had the material here for a book and that maybe I ought to take this material and, and create something that was a little more concise, a little better organized, you know, cause the blog again had kind of grown, uh, organically and, and publish the writing a little bit. And that's, that's essentially what the simple path to wealth is. Uh, and as I, as we talked about earlier, it's, it's the response to it's been far beyond anything I anticipated, but this was all, you know, this was all came out of this desire to have this information available to my daughter. In fact, she likes to tease me now. She says, you know, dad, if I'd listened to you when I was young, there'd be no blog, there'd be no books and David wouldn't want one interview, you You know? So here we are. So I, I would all the little girl who wouldn't listen. Now, all of our kids, we, they have their own personalities and on unique things about them and dispositions towards certain subjects over others. Can you provide any guidance to parents out there who want to impart some of this wisdom on their children? You know, I, as, you, as you may have guessed from the story I just told, I mean, my track record in doing this is not particularly successful. Now, I'm relieved to say that my daughter, uh, who's about to turn 32, is well on the simple path to wealth and she's embraced the concepts, uh, but that came later in life. So I guess my first piece of advice would be don't push it too hard, too young. But the other thing is, as my wife observed, you know, she's absorbing more than I realized, even though there was a big part of her that didn't, didn't want to hear it. So don't be afraid to talk about it right? Don't push it too hard, but don't be afraid to talk about it. And the last thing I say is they pay much more attention to what we do than what we say. And we have always lived a modest life. We've always put a premium on spending our money on the stuff that was most important to us. And the single most important thing was buying our freedom. There's nothing that money can buy, as far as I'm concerned, that is more valuable than, than my freedom, you know, owning my own time. And I think she saw that and, uh, and that made a difference. Where on the spectrum do you fall as far as actually helping your children build wealth? For example, I have a daughter, she's 20, about to be 21. When she turned 15, well, before she turned 15, I had an UGMA account, Uniform Gift to Minors Act or an UTMA, same thing. Right. And I began contributing to that for her. And in this particular account, the day that she turns 18, where I have zero impact on this account whatsoever, yeah. legally, it, it, it basically completely becomes 100% hers to manage or to spend as she sees fit. And then when she turned 15 and becoming uh, the uh, W-2 employee, she then qualified to start a Roth for herself. And I, I supported her in that. And for parents out there who want, who have the means, who have already, who are either 
well on their way to reaching their financial independence number or who have already achieved it and want to provide, there are clearly some pros and cons in that as life unfolds. But what is your instinct or, and Ian, you can share what you did or didn't do uh, if you're comfortable with that, but how much, especially for those of us who might be a little bit, a who might be able to, how much m literal money do you give your kids? And then at what stages? You know, it's, it's an interesting question. So first of all, I, I love the Roth idea. And so one of the things we did when our daughter started working in high school and she started having earned income is introduce her to the idea of having a, a Roth account. And I would fund it. So in order to have a Roth, you have to have earned income, right? So I couldn't, you can't fund it before they, they have a job. Although if you have a business, you know, some people employ, quote unquote, employ their kids at a very young age, mm -hmm. you know, they have blogs and their kid becomes a model at two years old, and, you know, I, whatever. But uh, for our daughter, it was when she started waitressing and, and making money that way. And and so I would put I put up the money for the Roth, you know, with whatever she she earned when she was young. So that was that was the first start of it. So I'm certainly not opposed to doing that. But I also at one of our Chautauqua events, Chautauquas were events that I ran for about ten years. We took small groups of people uh, to cool places to hang out and for a week and talk about this stuff. Um, I had a conversation with some people at one of those events and and about. Uh, inheritance. And, you know, my daughter was still young. I mean, she's still around, you know, late teens, maybe early 20s. And I wasn't certain as to how responsible yet she'd be with money. And I said, you know, if unless I become convinced that that she can handle it, that she will be responsible about money, I'm, I'm not going to leave her money. Because doing that, you know, leaving money to somebody who is irresponsible with it is harmful for them. I mean, it can lead to very disastrous consequences. So better to leave them nothing at all. Well, the good news is that she turns out to be very responsible with money. But the more interesting news about that is that because she's responsible with money, she doesn't need my money, right? She's got her own money. She's building her own wealth. So the irony is, it's kind of a catch-22, right? I wouldn't give her any money unless she was responsible for it. But because she's responsible for it, she doesn't need my money. So that's kind of that's kind of where we are. The other thing I will I will comment about is there's a book that's pretty popular out at the moment called Die with Zero. Uh, I have mixed feelings about the book, quite honestly. There's uh, there's some parts of it that I think provide appallingly bad advice, but there's some excellent parts of it. And one of the excellent parts, or one of the excellent points that the author makes is that if you're going to leave money uh, to your children, don't wait until you're dead. Because if you wait till you're dead, in assuming you have a long, healthy life, you're going to be 90 and your kids are going to be 60 and they're not really going to have any use for your money. So if you're going to do it, you know, start shifting some money over to them when they are young enough that maybe they need a down payment for a house or that kind of thing. But what I've learned is if you raise your kids well, and you teach them about this stuff, they're not going to need your money. And, you know, if for whatever reason they're not responsible with money, you don't want to leave them money. So there's do with that what you will. That's kind of a great irony. No, I like that perspective uh, because as much as we love our children, we don't know what really what kind of adults they're going right. to grow into. Uh, and as, as weird as that is to say, we like to think we have all of the influence, like 100 percent of influence of how our children turn out. We're good parents and. We're doing all the right things, and but we just don't know how it's going to turn out. So, you know, one of the things that that I always uh, that I believe and that I that I would say to my daughter when she was older uh, and could appreciate it is, I will always love you unconditionally. There is nothing you can do to change that. I will always love you unconditionally because you are my daughter. Whether I like you or not is up to you. And I think there's a distinction. And as it turns out, we're very fortunate because we love our daughter unconditionally, but we also like her. She's also a good person that we enjoy spending time with. And fortunately, she feels the same way about us. But that was up to her. You know, it's very possible that she could have grown, and a lot of kids do grow into people that you not don't necessarily like. So I think you should always love them unconditionally. But whether you like them or not is up to them.
Yeah. So if someone's listening to this and they're a parent or or they're not a parent yet and they're in a position where they're growing into adulthood or have a job, they might be thinking, oh, these two guys are decent financial means, lucky for their kids. Everything's great. But we all have to start somewhere. Like I didn't grow up with money at all. And I'm not sure your history, but I did not. Our family did not have much at all. And one way to get there is by following the principles that you advocate the simple path to wealth, taking action, automating your contributions to index funds out of your checking account or your paycheck to your 401k. And so for somebody who's listening to that and say, well, that must be nice. These two guys are and their kids. But I think the power of that is like who the information is there. You can make the difference in your life for yourself and for your kids, should you decide to do that. And you just have to take the action. And it takes just a first few steps of learning in your book, Simple Path to Wealth. Oh, by the way, did you know Simple Path to Wealth? I've, I just noticed it recently. SPW is like, or SP2W, I think is your now your, you have your own ticker symbol for your book and people's writing blogs and things like that. Did you notice that? No, I didn't. I, I refer to it yeah. as SPW, which is some people, you know, add all the the articles and the, the Simple Path to Wealth, which just looks cumbersome to me. So I, I always call it uh, SPW. You, you just wanted your own ticker symbol. That's what it is. That's no it is. kidding. <laughs> no, I didn't <laughs> nice. know that. That's kind of cool. Actually, that'd be pretty cool if somebody started an index fund with that as the ticker symbol. <laughs> that'd be pretty cool. Maybe you can now reach out to your friends over at Vanguard and, 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 and do that. Suggestion, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do want to mention that uh, we were very pro Vanguard. I have Vanguard uh, funds. Y you advocate for those as well. I do. Uh, but, I, but I will say, if you're listening to this and in Either you don't have Vanguard offered in your 401k or you already have a Fidelity account or any other brokerage account, look for like investments and a quick Google search of what is the Fidelity equivalent of VTSAX will get you will get you what you want. Exactly. So you don't have to be in VTSAX, uh, but it is it's more of a, a philosophy as, of using the broad market low cost index fund strategy. And almost every, if not every fund family has those kinds of funds for your investments. If you find that, that they're unif you're like, say you're, you, fidelity and your user interface is much nicer than Vanguard's, <laughs> uh, which is one of my few complaints about Vanguard is their user interface is not very intuitive at all. Uh, their website's cumbersome, but you got to memorize like where, where the drop down menus are that you re regularly go. Uh, and if Vanguard, if you're listening to this, please fix it. I know I'm not the first one to, to make this comment to you uh, formally. Uh, but if, if you're listening to this and you're saying, okay, I already have a Fidelity account, there are equivalents and a quick Google search will get you there. Just make sure you're looking at expense ratios and uh, ERs or MERs, and but it's, it's not hard to find. Yeah, what you're, I mean, I'll, I'll second that. I, you know, a what you're looking for is either an S&P 500 index fund or a total stock market index fund. And an S&P 500 index fund is essentially the same whether you're buying Fidelity's version or Vanguard's or Schwab's or whatever. And the same thing with the total stock market. So that's the litmus test. Like you, I have a preference for Vanguard for reasons we can delve into. And also like you, uh, I am not happy with their website. And they revamped it maybe a year ago, a little, maybe a year and a half ago now. And in the process made it, in my opinion, much more cumbersome and you know, I, there, there's a, without going into the weeds, I mean, you know, if I want to look at my activity in a specific fund in my portfolio at Vanguard, I have had to call them at least half a dozen times to walk me through the process, which they have done. And, and I will give Vanguard props that, that their, their reps are great. They're very patient in, in walking me through it, but you shouldn't have to do, you know, I'm a reasonably bright guy. It is so it is so counterintuitive that I have to be reminded over and over again, how the hell do I get to where I want to be? And and I always when I get these these people on the line, and they're always very, very nice and very, very helpful, but I, I always complain bitterly and and they're like, Yeah, we hear it all the time. So not a strong I mean, Vanguard has some work to do and they made it worse, not better with their last revamp. And I have never used Fidelity, but I do understand that their interface is is good. So if you're 
at Fidelity and your fan, there's no reason necessarily to change. Um, but the reason I like Vanguard is the whole idea of indexing and low costs is hardwired into the Vanguard DNA. Companies like Fidelity have been dragged kicking and screaming into it by the competitive pressures that, frankly, Vanguard brought to the market. So I, I want to be invested with a company where this is not something they've been forced to do, but something that's that's hardwired into their DNA. And I'm willing to put up with the with the cumbersome website to do that. But yeah, it's it's an issue. <laughs> it is an issue. Yeah. And you you think in a world today where apps and user experience is like number one and on probably every programming team's yeah. Like priority list, it just misses the mark. But your investments are still there. It's with a good company. And if you're, and, and, you're, and I would, I would encourage anybody who is a Vanguard investor to whine and complain about this issue, because you know, I, I think the reps tell me that they're hearing it a lot, and so hopefully it'll it'll sink into the powers that be. Well, Vanguard and broad market index fund investing aside for a moment, you are a writer. The simple path to wealth. SPW is not your only book. Since then, you have published two more books. And I, part of my income is from rental properties. And I'm grateful for that. However, in hindsight, I might have done it a little bit differently. Can you tell us about your second book and what the gist of that book is and how real estate should or shouldn't be a part of one's portfolio? Uh, like you, when I was younger, I, I fooled around with investment real estate for a while and and, and had some success with it uh, until I reached the conclusion it was way too much like work for my personal tastes. But the very first piece of real estate I ever bought was a condo in Chicago that I bought to live in that morphed into an investment because I couldn't sell it when I wanted to move on. And suffice to say, it was an unmitigated disaster. Uh, caused me a lot of angst at the time and a lot of money at the time. And it's not large amounts of money now, but it certainly was then. So the good news is I got a book out of it. It's very short. It's very cleverly illustrated. I found a wonderful illustrator and it's called How I Lost Money in Real Estate Before It Was Fashionable. And it is the tragic comic story of my, my Chicago condo which I can finally, after all these years, laugh about. You know, this was something I bought in the late 1970s. Um, but it's an entertaining story, and I think it's a cautionary tale for anybody who is thinking about buying their first piece of real estate and or investing in real estate. Because there's so many books out there that make it sound like it's an easy, simple way to get wealthy. And it certainly is a way to get wealthy. But it's like any other business. You had better know what you're doing if you expect to get those kinds of results. And I think a lot of people, including me back in the day when I bought this thing, have no idea what they were doing. And uh, it just, it leads into uh, all kinds of disasters, which that, that book talks about, and which I, I can now laugh at, but they weren't funny for me at the time. One of them, and I think maybe this will be shocking to people, is when I was trying to get rid of this condo, the condo market in Chicago in the day had gotten so bad that I couldn't get a broker to take the listing. Now, when you think about that, when you know a broker, it doesn't cost a broker anything to take a listing. And on the off chance it sells, they get paid, even if they do no work on it. Things were so bad in those days that they wouldn't even take the listing to offer it for sale. And I think sometimes in this more robust economic times we live in, people don't appreciate that that too can happen. So that's the that, that's the second book, How I Lost Money in Real Estate Before It Was Fashionable. It's a short, fun, cleverly illustrated, and I can say that because I didn't do the illustrations book. Did you only have one investment property in your past other than a primary residence? No, no. After, after I... Uh, uh, after the condo, I went on and, and did a little more in real estate. And that, because I learned some better lessons with the condo, I, 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 did, I did better. And I, I, you know, I made some money. But again, it's a lot of work. And one of the things, you know, in, I was in Chicago at the time. And part of the reason I stepped away from it is I moved away from Chicago. And I didn't want to be a long-distance landlord. 
although with the technology these days, I guess that's a lot easier to do. Um, but the other reason is, you know, when you're a landlord, at least in those days, you you get to know other landlords, you know, other people who are investing in property as you're, you know, looking at properties and, and doing, and you're finding people that, and there was no internet in those days. So if you were going to learn about this, you had to find people who were doing it that, that would talk to you. And I'd sit around with these, these guys and, and the conversations would always turn to these nightmare tenants, you know, who just, you know, not only didn't pay the rent, but absolutely destroyed the place that they were living in. And I had never had the experience of, of having one of those tenants, but I'd sit there and I'd listen to these people and, and I'd, and I'd say, you know, I'm not, I'm not smarter than these people, particularly not about real estate. I'm certainly not as experienced as they are. And so the only reason I haven't had this horrible experience in my life isn't because I'm doing something right. It's just my bad luck hasn't turned up yet. And I thought, you know, it's a lot of work. And I, I just, I don't want to someday, if I keep doing this, I'll have that nightmare tenant that I don't, I don't want to live through that. So that's when I decided to sell things off and, and, and I've never regretted it moving on. Yeah. It's interesting because I, I think sometimes it also matters where you're at in life and, and your current net worth of like, where do you think real estate might be a good investment or not? For example, uh, at my peak, I owned seven rental properties yeah. in middle Georgia and all probably lower. They were not expensive properties. I live in San Diego now. I could probably buy all of my properties for the price of one house here. <laughs> and they were good rentals. I mean, yes, very bumpy. It is not passive by any means. So if you're if you if you hear that rental real estate is passive, it is not. It's work and it's a headache and it takes mental bandwidth. But it could be worth it. And for me, I thought it was worth it as I was going through it, even with the ups and downs. Uh, because my idea was that it's like a hedge against inflation. Rents will go up. Um, I did not, uh, my properties did not appreciate as much as some people want them to appreciate when they buy their rental properties. Right. Um, and I'm, I was military, so I knew I was going to get a pension, those, those kind of things. So it sort of fit. However, looking back, I have since sold four of those properties. So now I only own three because I'm want simple. Right. And in the idea of simple, why not just start that at the beginning and just funnel all that into index funds? And if I had a crystal ball and I knew the market was going to be what it was over the last decade, that's exactly what I should have done. <laughs> uh, and, and, yeah. and, and maybe I should have just done it anyway. Uh, you know, knowing what I know now, because it's simple and I may sell the other ones in the future. Um, because I don't want to continue dealing with those issues. It doesn't fit into my lifestyle right now. I'm already retired. I'm financially independent. I'm on the other side of the country. Um, I don't have problems managing the properties from a distance, but it's just one more thing you have to worry about when you want to worry about other things. Yeah. Being in the, in the financial independence community, I've gotten to know a lot of real estate investors who have done it six, like you have done it successfully. And, and, um, uh, and a lot of them are going to continue to do it because they just, they, it's what they love to do. And that's great. But there are a lot of them who are like you who have had a good run, have made it work, but are kind of saying, you know, I, I just, I, I just don't want to put in the effort anymore. And there's kind of a nice transition into index investing from real estate investing. If you want to do it, you know, you can, you can start taking that cash flow and, and buying your index funds. You can, as you sell off properties, you can, you can sh transfer that money. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's, if when you're young and aggressive and taking those risks, it's probably not a bad thing to do, provided that you take the time to learn how to do it properly as you did. And as I eventually did, <laughs> but, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's looking back on it. It's, it's way too much like work for my taste. <laughs> Let's get to your most recent book. It's Pathfinders. It was released last year in 2023. I actually have that one on my on my desk here. You've got it there and I've got it on my phone and my Audible app. Well, there you go. I've been listening to it. <laughs> yeah. What I really liked about this book is it's a series of stories, real life stories right. of people who have discovered the simple path to wealth and or solid FI core principles, adopted those principles and made a change in many cases 
very drastic change in their life for the better. And one, one problem that I see as someone who is in the financial independence community, who's a huge advocate, is how do you message financial independence to the masses so that it's, it seems relatable, attainable, and a realistic approach? For someone who doesn't know anything about financial independence, many times my pushback is, not my pushback, what I get as pushback is, well, I don't make enough money. There's no way I can do it. Uh, I've got all these bills. I've got debt. And one of your stories in Pathfinders really stood out. And it's from Joe and Ali Olson, who were both educators in the Pacific Northwest, I, I believe. They had modest incomes of, I believe at no point did they each earn more than $44,000 a year for their base salaries. And right around the time that they were 30, they became millionaires because they followed your advice. So I, that's a story that I now, as someone who I, I've had a decent income throughout my career as a military officer, and I've got a pension. So I, my story also doesn't relate to the masses. But for those people who say, I don't make enough money. Well, here's a prime example of how two people who combined did not make more than $100,000 a year did it by the age of 30 or right around the age of 30. So that's inspirational. And it shows that it can be done. Not just a blanket, I can't do it because dot, dot, dot. And in your accumulation of these stories, are there is there any particular story that stood out to you as inspiring or surprising? So, you know, this, the story you selected is a great example of one of the reasons that I'm excited about this book. Because within about six months of The Simple Path to Wealth coming out, I started hearing from people who'd read it and talking about how they took the principles in it and, uh, and were applying them to their own lives. And these stories were coming from all over the world. And in many ways, The Simple Path to Wealth was written for one person. It was written for my daughter, who was in, in the United States, an American, at the very beginning of her journey. And I was hearing stories from people taking the principles in the book from other parts of the world. I was hearing from people who were much older and further along in their journeys. And maybe they had debt to unwind, or maybe they had investments that were not well considered to unwind and all these kinds of things. So I've Pathfinders is a book. Uh, it was published last fall on, on October 31st, took two years uh, to do it, but it's a book that I, I've wanted to do for years to share those stories for a lot of the reasons that you, you mentioned is that the pushback against the idea of pursuing financial independence most commonly is, well, that's great if you're a, if you're a high tech engineer and you're making six figures, but it doesn't apply to the rest of us. And that always frustrated me because in the real world, when I'd go to Chautauquas or, or I'd, I'd go to conferences and I'd meet people in the FI community, that was not the profile. You know, the profile was incredibly diverse. I mean, diverse in, in income uh, levels, diverse any way you could think of it, racially, uh, sexual orientation, age, education, you know, it was this incredibly diverse community of people who just said, you know, I'm going to go out and do this. And Pathfinders reflects that. And so there are a lot of stories in there, like the ones you allude to. I mean, there's a story in there from a guy who was a, a migrant uh, vegetable picker, you know, as a kid. He was picking asparagus and, you know, he's building a, a he's got a, a multi hundred thousand dollar net worth at this point and, and growing. There's a story from someone who talks about how when they were a kid, the people who had flush toilets were the rich people. So following the simple path to wealth, becoming financially independent is not just for highly educated, highly compensated people. In fact, um, in some ways, it's almost harder for them because they get caught up in lifestyle inflation and they spend every dime that they make. Uh, so th those are the kinds of stories that I love about. It. I think Pathfinders in many ways is the better introduction to this idea of pursuing financial independence than the simple path to wealth itself. You know, early on, somebody asked me in an interview, you know, do you have to read the simple path to wealth first? And I said, no, I mean, you can, you can read either one first. It doesn't matter. But the more I thought about that, 
the more I have come to think that you're better off, if this is all new to you, reading Pathfinders first and reading these stories and really in understanding how doable it is, you know, how, how accessible it is, regardless of where you're coming from. Certainly anybody who is able to listen to our conversation is able to pursue uh, financial independence. So, and then if you read the stories and, and you're inspired, then the simple path to wealth is sort of the, the, you know, the, how to actually do it, the how to manual and on how to pursue this. But Pathfinder sort of shares with you how accessible it is and what a big difference it's made in people's lives who, who choose to, to get on this path. So I like it. The two most striking stories to me, um, uh, that were so unexpected is there's a story in there from a guy in Ukraine who not only is pursuing the simple path to wealth himself, but he has a, a podcast in Ukraine talking uh, in Ukrainian, talking to, to other Ukrainians. Well, this is a country that's being invaded, that's at war. So, you know, when I hear people say, oh, you know, it sounds good, but, you know, I'd have to give up my two least luxury cars you know, like, well, okay, maybe you're not quite motivated enough. There's also a story in there from a guy in Russia who's pursuing the simple path to wealth. This, this is the country that's doing the invading that has massive economic sanctions lodged against it. Uh, and he's still figuring out a way. So, I mean, those were the two most surprising stories to me. But yeah, and and then of course there are the more typical. You know, there's a story of a of a couple in from Ohio that that were high tech engineers. They went to Silicon Valley. They figured out a way to live inexpensively, relatively anyway, in Silicon Valley while they were making the big bucks. And after a few years, they moved back to Ohio, where the cost of living was a lot lower, where their family was retired. So you know, certainly if you have a job like that. And you play your cards right, you have some advantages. That's the, so. There's stories like that in there too. But yeah, it's really accessible to anybody, and I think that's the power of the book. And the stories are just fun to read too. Yeah, I like that because again, I haven't thought about the order that you read the two books in. But one of the most important things for people on their financial independence journey, or who are debating on whether they're going to start a financial independence journey, is what's your why. And these stories share the why of so many people. Yes. And you can, with stories, as stories tend to do, uh, they get a response from us and we buy in and we, there's a believability and a relatability. And if in this book, there's so many stories, you, if you find relatability to yourself, between yourself and any one of these stories, then you might be able to see a why of phi for yourself. And that's what's going to get you through the journey. You have to have that clear why of phi. Additionally, I think to help people overcome that, you know, I, I don't make enough money or this or this circumstance is not me. And I can't ever do that because of X, Y, or Z. Okay, great. Well, let's compare your current habits right now at 23 or 33 or 43. And what do you think is going to happen? What trend lines have you had in your last decade? Let's assume those same trend lines continue. Is that what you want 10 years from now? If it's not, then do something about it. Yeah, do something different. And do something different. You may not get to $3.26 million, your fine number, but having 300,000 in a checking account is better than having negative 300 checking in your in your checking account or you know a debt of $300,000, which is where you're gonna end up maybe if you keep doing what you're doing. So no matter what, whether it's you officially reach financial independence or not, it's still, a better path than what most people are probably on right now, and they can improve their lot in life. I, th I think it's important, the great point, and, and I think it's important to realize that this is not an on-off switch, right? It's not like you start at zero and nothing happens until you reach that magical, I'm now financially independent number. The moment you start, you're a little bit stronger than you were the day before. It's kind of like going to the gym, right? You're not going to bench press 300 pounds the first day. But the moment you go, you're a little bit stronger than you were the day before. And as you said, you know, not only are you better off with 300000 in your bank account, you're better off with $300 in your bank account than nothing or 3000 
every every step makes you a little bit stronger. And then because of compounding, those steps begin accumulating because when you're first beginning, you know, it's all your effort to come up with the money to put into those accounts. But over time, that money is now working for you. And at some point, there will be enough money there where it's the money itself is actually making more money for you than what you're contributing. And that's a that's a magical thing to watch happen. And every step of the way, you get stronger. And even you know, even if you're 60 or, or or you know, why not be stronger a decade from now? Even if you're 70, you might not be technically financially independent, but you're going to be stronger than you were. One of my favorite quotes, but the quote is if you, Leo Burnett, he was a a big ad agency guy back in the sixties, started an ad agency. Uh, Leo Burnett's quote is if you reach for a star, you might not get one, but you won't come up with a handful of mud either. And so I say, reach for the star, you know, reach for financial independence and you might not get there, but you won't come up with a handful of mud either. Yeah, that's a good one. I know we've been talking about money for over an hour and because of what we do in our space, it's easy to assume that that's what we're really passionate about and that's what we spend most of our time doing. But you're not only the author of three books, but you're also the author of sci-fi stories. So would you like to share your favorite sci-fi story that you have written and <laughs> tell us where we can read more. I think you're referring to to my other blog, uh, ah. Uranium C, and uh, that's that's kind of never been publicized. Uh, it's it's a WordPress blog. It doesn't get much traffic. I haven't done anything on it for a number of years, um, uh, but it was kind of fun, and it got a reason for the few people who read it. It it it, it got a good response. It was interesting uh, at one point, and this is a number of years ago, I think it was on, on Reddit, a conversation started where uh, this woman said something to the effect of, you know, I, I, I've read The Simple Path to Wealth and, and JL Collins and H.com, and I, I really like his investing approach. It makes a whole lot of sense for me. But then I found this other blog that he's written, this Uranium C thing, and this guy's out of his mind. He's clearly crazy. You know, he's and and so can I trust his investment advice? And then a debate erupted, as it tends to do in, in Reddit, was some people saying, well, yeah, what you're reading on Uranium C is clearly nuts, but that doesn't mean his investment advice is bad. And then other people saying, what you're reading on Uranium C is fiction, uh, you know, but and I'll leave people to decide uh, for themselves. Uh, All right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to get that link and I'm going to put it in the YouTube description notes so that we'll, we'll, fans of yours yeah. can search it out and get that traffic up and maybe inspire you to continue writing. Well, it brought you joy at one point, right? Well, yeah, it was it, it was it was fun. And I think it's it's an important story that needs to be told because most people don't realize, you know, it answer it answers the question. You know, there, there's the question out there of of, you know, where are the aliens? You know why don't why don't we see the aliens and and you know for anybody who's in, in interested in this there's the idea that there's filters that civilizations uh, collapse before they become interstellar travelers and what have you but that in fact is not the reason. Well, I like that cliffhanger. Now we got to go check it out to figure out what the real reason is. Now, so now the readership of that blog will go from. From one a month to, to maybe to two. To maybe <laughs> may, maybe one a week. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh, this has been great. Uh, so you've got where are you right now in the world? I'm in Florida. Florida. Yeah. Where I didn't know you lived in Florida. Well, I don't live in Florida. We we spent last winter in Florida and and uh, yeah, we liked the complex we were renting in last winter, so we we bought a condo here and so now we, uh, we the plan is to spend winters in Florida. Yeah, you're not from Georgia, so not too far. No, not uh, from, from Georgia. You. I'm very familiar in no. Florida and My been there many times. In Savannah at this point. Oh, beautiful! Yeah, another great place. Savannah. One of the few real estate. One of the few real estate markets that's actually doing pretty good right now. Yeah, Savannah is a beautiful place. Yeah, I, well, we had never been until she moved there, and now, of course, we've been many times. And you got to buy a second condo. Yeah, well, in no, Savannah, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> JL, thank you so very much for spending your time with me today. I think it's going to bring a lot of value 
to those who find this on YouTube or wherever they listen to it. Uh, I know you have touched the lives of many in a very positive way and a not only a life changing way, but a generational changing way. And I will be forever grateful for that. And I look forward to when you and I can actually meet face to face, maybe at a lake somewhere or in Florida or Savannah, or when you come out to San Diego, I'll, I'll be a great host for you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that as well. Uh, hanging out in the real world together. And this has been a blast. Thanks so much for inviting me to, onto the show. All right, you're very welcome. And thank you again. And thank you all for listening to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs>